everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance podcast. I'm Aaron. And I'm Brie. And today we have a returning guest with us. Please welcome back with us, Mona Sheroff. How are you? It's so happy to have you. We're so happy to have you on again. How's your 2022 been so far? You know, it's been great, and I'm super excited to be back with you guys again. I, I I love the fact that I can, like, be invited back to things. I just, it's so exciting, and you guys are so wonderful, and um, yeah, no, I'm super excited. 2022 has been good to me so far, I suppose, so yeah, great to be here with you guys. All right, well, are you ready to get into round two of Icebreakers? Okay, here we go. All right. What is something fun you've done since the last time we chatted? I went swimming with dolphins. And the funny part of that was, so I've had a lot of time with my children who are adults and don't live with my house and in my house anymore. But my son graduated and we went on a vacation <laughs> to Hawaii We and we were in San Diego with my daughter. And, you know, the, two of them are having convers- this conversation and they decided that my spirit animal was a dolphin. Okay. And that my spirit tree, if that's like a thing, <laughs> is the palm tree. And right after they decided that, we were in Hawaii, and I went swimming with the dolphins under the palm trees. And the like, the family text message was adorable because they're like, "She's in the land of her spirit tree with her spirit animal, and she's so happy." And it was the funnest thing. It was so. It was. They're just. It's amazing. It was just. It was just wonderful. I have to figure out a way to put it into a book one day, but it was just lovely. It was fun. Okay, so how does that get set up? Like, is there a like a tour group or something? Like, how did that happen? That sounds so fun. I feel like there's a couple of different ways to do that. So this was sort of like at a resort where they had like a huge like enclosure where they kept a few dolphins that, that they trained. And, you know, and I just want to say it, the dolphins looked very happy to me. It didn't seem like they were unhappy or didn't have enough room to swim around. But they are what, which I didn't know, that there are things called shallow water dolphins. And these are shallow water dolphins who even in the wild they only go up to 10 feet so you can actually walk down like this little man-made beach thing um it's like a beach you know it's a pool but it's a beach right and um and then swim out and then you have a group of a few other people and you have a trainer and the trainer basically calls over the dolphins by name and and they are they're rewarded and you know and so you can pet them and you can swim with them and I think I have a picture of one giving me a kiss and it was really, it was really nice. And the other way you could do it is to go out into the ocean and like go where all the dolphins are and then just kind of get in the water with them. So that's my next step. That wasn't, we didn't plan well enough for that. So the next time I have an opportunity, I would like to actually do that. But this was like a nice first step with the dolphins. Well, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be and why? Oh my God. So I I have a couple of places, but the two places that came to mind, like, and I'm just going to go with what was on the top of my head was Heidelberg, Germany and Tuscany. And Heidelberg, Germany is because we used to live there. My husband served and um, while he was serving, we lived in Heidelberg, Germany for about two and a half or three years. My daughter was born there. And it was such a wonderful time um, just to live in Europe and like go downtown. And finally, you know, fast forward when our kids were older, we took them back and they loved Heidelberg also, you know, just the Popstrasse and and the whole that culture of just slowing down a little bit was just so was so wonderful. Um, And Tuscany, because I keep saying I want to go and I haven't gone yet. And I keep watching all these lovely movies about couples falling in love in Italy. I'm already in love. I have yeah. a husband for almost 29 years, but I want to take him there and I want to be like, let's just live here for a little while. Like, let's just drink wine and walk to the piazza. Like, let's do that, you know? So to me, those seem like very romantic and very yeah. Heidelberg's a little nostalgic places. And I think it's probably the romance that calls to me. If you could be any supernatural creature, what would you be and why? This was so much harder for me to answer. I think I would end up, I would want to be somebody like super strong, like Wonder Woman or Supergirl. I'm currently watching Supergirl. Like I, I'm years behind, but I'm in mm-hmm. watching that right now. Um, I just, I, I think I really would like to have like super strength. Well, you get a chance to live your own romance novel. Would you be a historical, contemporary, dark, paranormal, or a mix? 
I think I would be a mix of contemporary and paranormal because I think after the superpower question, I was like, I really okay. want the superpowers in my realm. Um, and I'd want it to be like either contemporary, maybe even like futuristic, you know? Um, I think the historical thing kind of scared me a little bit because I like indoor plumbing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be practical here. Congratulations on your most recent Harlequin Special Edition released match by Masala, book two in your Once Upon a Wedding series. Have you celebrated its release? You know what? I have to say, I haven't like celebrated, celebrated quite yet. And a little, it goes back to a little bit of what we were saying before we got started. I have another release coming up and I was on deadline and my daughter got engaged and my son got a new job. And so I think we celebrated, like everyone was like, yay, your book came out. And, you know, we were all like, so I had a glass of wine that day. And my thing to do um, whenever I'm in town and my book releases, because interestingly enough, I am not always in town. Um, but if I'm in a place where I can get to a bookstore, I'll go to whatever bookstores are around me and I go and sign their stock. And that's just kind of my thing to do. And I did do that on release day. I went to my local uh, Barnes and Nobles because it's near my office and I had to go to the office that day too. And um, I, I know the manager there. And so we, I signed the stock that was, that was in, in the Barnes and Nobles. And um, I meant to go and go investigate more bookstores. And I, just haven't gotten to to do that. Like I want to go see it on more shelves, but it hasn't happened yet. So I think the way I celebrate is I like to go and see it on shelves. I like to have a drink. I like to gather with friends. And I did do that, but we did it sort of at different times. So it's always celebratory. It's always fun, like on that particular day. So, um, but I didn't have like a party or anything at this point. So I think that's perfect. I mean, I would die if I was in the Barnes and Noble and I just looked over and I was like, oh, that's Mona Shroff signing books. <laughs> I was going to ask about the uh, the staff if they give you trouble or not because I've heard I've heard on Twitter that some authors get asked for ID when they go into bookstores and <laughs> and start trying stuff. To- you know what? That has actually never happened to me. They they have always been very very friendly and very forth. The only thing that they do do is that the like before I met the manager, the employee would go and get the manager. And the manager at my particular local Barnes and Nobles is loves romance. Oh, so it's awesome. just, so she, we actually, I had a signing there over um, the spring and we're setting one up for the fall. And so, you know, the fact that I'm in there, I'm like, I'm here to sign your stock. And she's like, yep, just wait a second. She, she's so, she gets her shelves the way she wants them. And, you know, it's really, really cute. And she's very, very supportive. Um, and so I have to say, I haven't experienced, I did think it was weird. I think that my first book released and I was in Nashville with my daughter and I walked into the Barnes and Nobles and I was like, I want to sign my stock. And they were like, okay. And they literally just, I got the books and they didn't ask me for ID. I'm like, how do you know it's me? <laughs> like, how do you know I'm not just some Joe Schmo off the street who was just like, I'm going to sign <laughs> these books. And they, they didn't ask. And I mean, I mean, there is a picture of me inside. I guess they could have checked. Right. But they didn't. So I was like, how do you, how do you know yeah. that that's fine? Um, but yeah, I've not, I've been blessed and, and I've always, they're just kind of like, sure. And they put stickers on it. And most people are very welcoming. Most bookstores yeah. um, that I've done this at have been very welcoming. Now I don't go and sign at Walmart because I feel like, I mean, I guess I could, but I feel like I would get in trouble if they saw me writing in a book, like at Walmart, I don't know, or Target or something. I don't know if that's the same thing. So Yeah. Well, please share with us what Matched by Masala is about. Oh my God. I love Matched by Masala. Matched by Masala is that um, sibling's best friend. So it's Amr's sister's best friend. And the sister was book one. Um, Divya is the best friend. And then the reverse is my best friend's brother. And um, Amr has, it's like the girl next door, but he's across the, they live across the street type of thing. And he has, as the older brother, he has been in love with, with Divya probably for as long as he can remember. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's really cute. And, and she is, she has her own issues and, and we'll, we can talk about those. So she's kind of been oblivious to like all of this. Um, as you get into Match by Masala, you do learn that they had a little blip of a history there, um, but neither one of them kind of knew what to do with that. So they just sort of let it go to the wayside. Um, 
And so it's literally, it's about, and like any other romance book, it's about their journey, not only to each other, but their own individual journeys of like healing and their own personal growth arc before they can actually be together. Well, what inspired the choice to write Umar and Divya's romance as a sibling's best friend? Like when you sat down to kind of plan out the series, was that the initial plan or how did it happen? Hmm. See, I think it's cute that you think I planned out the whole series. (laughs) Well, okay. Sibling's best friend is my favorite trope, but I'm so used to it being like brother's best friend. So I love that it's sister's best friend. And I was like, Ooh, I love this Mona. So the series, the the series has to touch a wedding, right? So it's once upon a wedding. So the series has touched a wedding. So the first one is like at a wedding. And, you know, it's one of these things where I did get good advice from a mentor of mine who said, it's a series. As you're writing the first book, at least have an idea of what the next few books are going to be about so you can tease them and so that you can put what you need to in this book because it has, once it's published, you can't change it and it has to be true in the next book, right? And so as I was writing Anita and Nikhil, this character of her brother, and it's not spoilery for me to say that uh, Anita and Amr's parents um, died a few years ago in a car crash. And that's part of the wound that they each have to deal with in their own separate stories. So he plays a big part in her life because he's all she has, right? And vice versa. So it just seemed the natural thing to kind of do Amr's story. And then I thought, well, who else does Anita have in her life? I thought, well, she's got a best friend. You know, and then I was kind of playing the next book and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I bet you he's in love with the best friend. And they, they were both chefs. And I was like, that's what happened. So now they're going to be best, like the sibling's best friend. And we're going to have to figure, figure, figure them out. Right. So in book one, you know, Umar needs help with like the cake has is a disaster. Something happened at the wedding and he needs help. So Anita calls in Divya and is like, go help him with the pastries and he's like, Oh my God, why is she here? Type of thing. And it, so that tension was right there. And it, it's one of those things. I, I, I used to think that I was a plotter, but I'm actually more a pantser. I do plot a little bit, but I'm more a pantser. And when I was writing book one, all of a sudden I was writing it and I just, Amr was so tense with her presence. And I was like, Oh, this is not tense because of ego. This is tense because he's actually in love with her. So then I was like, that's their book. I'm glad you said that because he is full-fledged freaking out when he sees (laughs) it. It's so cute. And right. And then I kind of made her oblivious. And then I decided that she like she she's Anita's best friend and she's like part of that rock that she's always needed. So I made her a really tough girl. Mm -hmm. A strong woman. So that's kind of how that came out. So sometimes it's plotted through, and sometimes it's just like how it comes to me. Yeah. We must share a quote that captures the frustrating push and pull between Divya and Amar. He couldn't kiss her like that and then just up and leave and act like nothing happened. What advice would you give to any aspiring writers writing their first sibling's best friend romance? So it's a little bit of what we just um, talked about, right? Like, I think you have to know their history. Um, You have to know, are they, are they falling in love now? Like you, you decide when your story starts. Does your, are they falling in love as the story starts? Like something has come to push them together again and they're falling in love. But even before that, like they have this one person in common. Are they enemies? Are they frenemies? Are, you know, has, has the best friend never liked the sibling? Has the sibling never thought that the best friend was a good best friend? Or do they adore each other? Do they have that mutual respect of how they treat that middle, the person that they have in common? Um, or like, you know, in Amr's, in Amr's case, you know, part of the reason that he fell in love with Divya was, was because he watched how strong she was, right? And how she dealt with her issues and that kind of thing. And then when Anita needed someone and their parents died, she was there for them, right? So that's, that's part part of their arc, but you could easily do it as they have this person they love in common, but they hate each other. And now you got siblings, best friend and enemies to lovers together, right? So I think you have to know or figure out like what kind of chemistry do they have before the story starts? I'm a big backstory person. I got like a ton of backstory that nobody knows about and to, that I have to know before I can write because I need to know where everybody came mm-hmm. from. So if you're going to write a sibling's best friend, I mean, this isn't the first time they've met. They've known each other for a long time. So why are they falling in love now? 
what is different? Like that, you got to nail that down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, their kisses are just, it's the fire is just there and you can, it's just so, I say frustrating in the best way possible because you can feel how frustrating it is for the both of them. Like, I love you, but we can't do this and I'm not going to do this on both of their parts. And you're just like, as the reader, you're like, you both love each other though. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost like they use it for a while, like Anita as the excuse. And Anita's like totally cool with it, you know? <laughs> like, I think I was really, I was really adamant when I did this that I didn't want it to be like that, that Anita would really care. Right. One way or the other. Right. Like she wasn't mm -hmm. going to be like, oh my God, you can't date her. Oh my God, that's my brother. Like it wasn't gonna be like that. I had this, I had this vision in my head, if if you're a friends fan, of like when Ross finds out about Monica and Chandler and he's just like, My best friend and my brother or my sister. And then he's like, Oh, my best friend and my sister. Yeah. Like I thought it was more like that than it was kind of that, like, don't you know, like uh, she was gonna be the person to stand in their way. I didn't really see her as that kind of person mm -hmm. but I did see how the two of them could absolutely use her yeah. as an excuse because of the things that they were afraid of well cancer is a part of Divya's backstory and really shape who she is when we meet her at the beginning of the book can you talk about the writing of this very important part of her character sometimes you write what what, what what's going on like you know in your life that type of thing and Cancer was around. I think it's around for everybody. And, you know, I found, like, I, I wanted to write someone who beat it, right? Um, and I wanted her, and, and I thought, well, even if she beat it, it's not something, mm -hmm. she doesn't, she doesn't want to be identified as a cancer survivor. That is not, she is a cancer survivor, but that's not all that she is, right? So... I was, I, I just put, I wanted, she was like, she's multi-layered and I needed her to be a tough person. And I'm like, okay, if she's this person and she beat this kind of a disease. How did it form her? Like what fears, do, what fears are behind that armor that she has up, right? Like she can't have come out of unscathed. It was during her developmental years, right? So no one comes out of something like that unscathed, no matter how loving your parents were and your best friend and all of that kind of thing. And um, I mean, I think that's what I was kind of looking for, like how to shape her and how to make her this strong person, um, but still be sort of like a normal human being, right? Like she thinks she's over it, but she really hasn't really dealt with it. She's just like, I'm just going to live every single solitary minute. Yeah. I can't rest. I can't sleep. I can't watch a movie again. Like that's a waste of time. You know, those kinds of things. Like she's just like, there's because she's still afraid. She's afraid she's going to get sick and she's not going to get to do things that she wants. Oh, one of my favorite quotes is, oh gosh, I, I shared it on our Twitter. It was... Uh, her saying, let me, I'm going to pull it up because now I have to read it because it's going to bother me that I don't know it by heart. Yeah, because I was blowing up today. Good Sorry. job, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I never should have let it go past the first night, but I've been cancer free for so long. I thought, what the hell? I can be like other people and fall in love, sleep in late, linger. This, she waved a finger between them, was a risk I never should have taken. And I was like, here we have our adventurous Divya scuba diving, riding motorcycles. But like that risk when it comes to Ummer, like she has that moment where she's like, I can't do this to him. I shouldn't have put myself in this situation. It was like a very, I'm still a, a I'm still a woman. I'm still a human, you know, like I still, mm -hmm. that fear and anxiety is still there. I just thought the cancer portion was so inspiring and just so, it made me think of a, a conversation I had with a supervisor some years ago. I thought so much about Divya. We were at work one day after work and she's like, I don't want something drastic to happen to make me start living rather than existing and Divya is just one of those characters that reminds you of that yeah no a hundred percent a hundred percent and I think that um I think she was fine when she was risking her own self um but she, once she you know and in that moment like she doesn't have to say the words even she's in love with him and she she knows he's in love with her and she's just like this this should never have happened like I never should have let this happen because I don't know the future she wants to control it and she can't yeah. Golly, love is the biggest risk. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? it is, you yeah. know what? It's the biggest risk. And I mean, it's the romance writer in me or the romantic person in me that comes out. Mm -hmm. It is the biggest risk. It's also the biggest reward. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Well, we must ask about the character of Parole. I hope I pronounced that right. Needless to say, we, were expect- we weren't expecting this particular turn in the story, but it felt like such an important per- uh, turn. As the writer, what can you talk about um, uh, the, the why behind um, this character? So I, I put Parole in there um, because she it, when, when Divya looks at her, she sees herself. Mm-hmm. She sees the younger version of herself who was going through all of those things. So it served a couple of different purposes. And one one purpose was for the reader um, as you know, to see who Divya was when she was going through that without like doing flashbacks and things, right? So that was one of the things. And the other, you know, and the other part of it is that cancer is unpredictable. And I know we write HEAs, um, you know, and so you can be guaranteed that, you know, Divya is safe because she's going to get her happily ever after. Um, and because I because I knew that the reader would understand that Divya was going to have her happily ever after and she was safe, I felt like Barrel had to, Barrel's character had to begin and end the way that she did because it was just more real. And it also touched those things that Divya was so afraid of. So it helped to bring out to the reader and to Parul, I mean, and to Divya, as well as Amr. Like, and Amr, you know, Amr's in love with Divya, but, like, she keeps a lot of that to herself. So her fears, he, he, he may not actually, he doesn't actually know her fears until he starts to see it this way, right? Um, and the reader sees it that way, too. So, you know, it Parul played into all those different types of things um, that everybody, the, the reader and Amr and Divya need to learn about each other and about what the st- backstory was and where she kind of came from and the pain of losing her, um, you know, initially the pain of losing her feeds into, into Divya's fears, right? Um, until the end mm-hmm. when we see what it means to go on, you know, type of thing. And, um, and, and so just kind of, she just kind of paralleled for me and that, that's what, that was the character that was in there. I will say, I thought, I thought a hundred times before I let Bottle go, I was like, she can just be transferred to a hospital or she can do this or blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, nope, it's not real. It's not real. And I put it in there and I was like, okay, if my editor tells me that it's not going to fit with this type of a book, then I will consider pulling it out. But no one said anything. Is it Susan? Is Susan your, I think you mentioned Susan at the beginning of the book. Susan Littman. Shout out to Miss Susan. (laughs) (laughs) She knows what she's doing. She does. Because I think I three times just about a rule <laughs> the first time and i'm gonna get emotional but she says because she's like seven but how is she like she's 15 14 15. 15 yeah she says something to divya it's like do you think i could ever fall in love i just mm-hmm. thought that was so sweet and then um of course when we we lose her and then the scene where the boy that she likes comes i was like oh god mona what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> and divya's She's so hurt because she focuses on like, she'll never get to read Harry Potter, you know, stuff like that, that you're like, wow, yeah, like, Mm -hmm. when you lose, when teenagers die, it's like, you know, you think about the teens that died when you were in high school, and they're like, so frozen in time. And you think of like, all the cool stuff that they don't get to experience. And I was like, Oh, man, Mona, like, you are really putting us through the ringer here. Which is which is why I was a little I was a little nervous. I was like, Susan it may make me take this out. See what happens. <laughs> well, we're glad that you know, <laughs> she let it stay. So she helped me fix it works it works she's amazing well yeah. food feels like another character in the book for divya she loves making she loves it food making food for people is a way to make them happy and she's like people need to be more happy and amar he says something in the book along the lines of like he uses it as therapy uh mm-hmm. so we'd love to know how you decided on the different foods you included in the story because i mean don't read this book listeners <laughs> an empty stomach it's food (laughs) i love that you focus on like the spices like all the details just kind of like the dancing in the kitchen like moving around each other it's fantastic Mm -hmm. so can you talk about that yeah yeah so um you know they they were a chef and a pastry chef you know from the other books and so you know uh i felt like the pastry chef just felt divya filled divya's personality right like live every moment like it's your last type of thing so eat that cupcake you know like have 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 this crepe have the ice cream because 
these are the sweet things in life that makes us happy. Um, and I am an a- amateur baker. And before I started writing to the way that I'm writing now, I, I used to use my creativity came out in baking and I baked a ton of cakes for my kids growing up. And, you know, I'm still called on by the family when it, when you need a dessert, like they're like, Mona will bring it, you know? Um, I touched into some of that and I do like to do a little fusion. Like I like to take some of our Indian things and fuse it with the Western and, and kind of see what I can come up with. And, Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I kind of liked that about Divya because she was just happy and she's got this food truck and she's like, everybody should eat dessert. Like, you know, what, what everyone should eat dessert. Um, she also doesn't care what it does to her body. Yeah, She's just like, whatever, mm-hmm. I'm eating my cake. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have it, right? Um, yeah. And Amr, you know, his ties to food go back to his parents. Right. So he hasn't quite dealt with his grief. Um, and that's why he has a hard time letting go of that kitchen. And, you know, he his bond with his mom and his, you know, and his parents was learning how to cook at their side. So the foods that he makes takes him back to the time where they were they were they were with him. Um and some of the dishes that that I picked, like Divya's favorite Indian dish that um, that Amr makes for her when she has like broken up with him, type of thing, is actually my my son's favorite dish. When he comes home, when he when he comes home from college, that's the first thing he wants to eat. That's I don't even oh. have to ask him it. Like I know what I'm gonna make when he gets in the house. Like that's what he's gonna have. So I was like, oh, we'll make that Divya's favorite dish because I make it all the time, so I know exactly what's yeah. going in. <laughs> <laughs> so I can actually, you know, um, have Amr um, make it. Um, and then I felt like because I forced them to be in one kitchen together, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted their kitchen time, their their moving their their kitchen relationship to sort of mirror their relationship, right? So when they're unsure of each other and not, they, they kind of bumble around. And as they get to know each other, it's more of a dance because you can predict the other's movements as and move yourself around and they're they're not even really thinking about it right so that's when they're actually becoming a couple before they really know that they're a couple is in how they move around and how they know where things are or don't know where things are so when they have arguments and they can't find things that's why they can't find things so the the kitchen is kind of them as a couple Mm -hmm. so i i know and i and i don't even know that i was consciously thinking about it until later because i know you know i think about like cooking with my mother and my sister's-in-law you know um you know my sister's-in-law and i we live in three different states or places and when we get together we know each other's kitchens like we know our own and we know what our role is in each kitchen okay right (laughs) type of thing. So, you know, if I met my sister-in-law, one of my sister, if either of them, um, I know that my place, and we joke about this, my place is generally at the dishes and I am the dish bitch of the weekend. Like, <laughs> I do all the dishes. And when they come here, one of them does all the dishes. Yeah. So we know that like, okay, that's what's happening. And then if you're cooking, we kind of have figured out like, what everybody does and what everybody does well. And we can maneuver around any kitchen, any of our kitchens fluidly. And I feel like that is like a testament to our relationship, right? Like we, because we've known each other for 30 plus years and we've cooked together for that many years, right? So I just put that into Divya and Amr and their movements and what they were cooking. And I mean, it's not like Divya can't cook savory food and it's not like Amr doesn't cook pastry food, but they also have that immense respect for one another in what they can do. Well, listeners, this cover not only makes you fall in love, it also makes you hungry too, because it just has this perfect setting around these yes. beautiful characters that just look, are just looking so swoon worthy. It's, it's great. I agree. Yeah. Oh God, the cover is Gordon. I love the food truck in the back. <laughs> yes. I tell you, Harlequin has done me, done me right for all of my covers. All of Yeah. Them. You have gorgeous covers. Yeah. I have gorgeous covers. I love them. I love every one of them. Well, Amr shares something he said to his father prior to his passing. I said he was stuck in the past, that he couldn't progress. Amr himself is clearly still grieving the loss of his parents, but that quote perfectly pertains to him as well. Can you talk about writing Amr and his grief? Um, yeah, so Amr is stuck. Um, he is the he's the older sibling and he's the son. And as such, he would have felt like he had a certain responsibility to take care of his younger sister, um, particularly if his parents were not around. Um, but 
he doesn't, or at least in his mind, to him, to himself, he has not done what he was supposed to have done. And he also has a lot of regrets, um, rightfully so, you know, about some of the last things that he said to his dad. You know, you think about the things that you say in the heat of anger, and then if you never have that chance to apologize, and that, is the, that lives with you, right? So he just cannot, that compound it, you know, he just can't get past it. So he's sort of, he's stuck in his grief, and he doesn't, he, I think he almost doesn't even feel like he needs to get out of it. He sort of feels like I should be here because I did, I said bad things to my dad. And because I wasn't there for my, for my sister, you know, I don't really need to be happy. Like I, whatever I am right now, like that's what I deserve. And that's where I'm going to stay. Like I don't deserve to fall in love and be happy and move, deserve to even move past this. Like he is prepared to just live in his grief for the rest of his life. And he's like 28 years. Um, and that's a really terrible place to be, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, yeah. but I could absolutely, you know, sometimes I try to put myself in these situations. Like what if this was me? Like what would, what would be my lowest point? Like, and then give that to a character. We're so mean to characters. I'm like, let me pick my lowest possible thing that could happen to me and, and, and that I can't get out of. And let me give that to a character yeah. for a little while. <laughs> so I killed their parents. <laughs> um, yeah. I did. And, um, and they both deal with their grief very different because they're different. And there's different expectations of them and, from other people as well as from their own selves. And, um, and I felt like Divya was the perfect counterpart yeah. to that. Um, even though she's kind of living in grief too, but she has the complete opposite, <clears throat> the complete opposite response to it. This is the perfect example of two characters perfectly balancing each other out. They may not realize it for a long time, but they do. <laughs> Well, I mean, we've talked a, a lot about this book and I mean, I just feel like an emotional wreck after having read it because it's just so good. What is something that you hope readers take away from their experience of reading Matched by Masala? I mean, like any other romance, I hope that they have, I hope they enjoy it. I hope it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride. I hope it's an emotional experience. That's the kind of, um, that's the kind of book I like to write. I'm not like a rom-com writer. I wish I could be because I feel like I get all these ideas for rom-coms, but then I'm not fun. Like I don't do jokes, um, but I love the rom-coms that I read. And I feel like those are like, they're, they're funny, but they still, the good ones still take you on an emotional yeah. ride, um, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And that's what I would like, you know, to enjoy the journey, like follow them. If, if, if I did it well, then hopefully you'll cry. Hopefully you'll cheer. And then you'll be excited when they finally get to that happily ever after. Um, you know, I um, one of the things that one of my favorite things that I was I loved doing with Umar was the whole um, superhero T-shirt yeah, thing. Loved that. Um, I, I, I love that. that. <laughs> um, and and my my daughter who reads everything I write, she's she's like she's like that's my favorite part. <laughs> I love that he's so nerdy. She loved that he was so nerdy and he wore these superhero T-shirts like under his chef voice all the time. Um, so yeah, I just you know like any other book i just i hope that a reader picks it up and wants to take this journey and and enjoys it has a good time and maybe maybe it's a little bit of an escape from the real world yeah. for a little while i feel like yeah. while it's I, very few books I feel like have emotionally wrecked me in the last couple of years and this one emotionally wrecked me I mean we have Parul you take fury away from them and I almost lost it <laughs> when they found the owner of the dog but at the same time it's also like a really fun book I feel like all the food all the cooking I loved Anita I mean come on like Nick Nick how do we say Nikel? Nikhil, Nikhil. Oh my gosh, Amar is like so kind of mean to him for a little while. Like there's just, it's still a fun book. So it, you know, you said, you said even last time, like you don't write rom-coms, but like this is still a fun book, but I think you also balanced it just so perfectly with some really important stuff at the same time. So thank you for such a wonderful Thank reading you. experience Mona <laughs> I'm so happy you like I I would love people to have like that kind of an experience and be like you know what I really this was worth the few hours it took me to read oh. 
Yeah. In August, we're getting an HQN single title from you, The Second First Chance. Can you share with us what it's about? I would love to. I would love to share this book. Um, I'm so excited for its release in August. Um, this is the story about um, Next Door Neighbors. Um, so it's kind of like that boy next door, girl next door thing. But um, Rhea, Rhea and Dylan had fire and they lost people in the fire. And fast forward 15 years, they, and then they stopped talking to each other. Um, fast forward 15 years, and now Rhea is secretly a firefighter. Like, she hasn't even told her parents. Um, she doesn't talk to Dylan anymore. And because of a rescue dog, because Dylan is a vet, a veterinarian, um, he finds out that she is a firefighter and he is completely out of sorts because they are uh, much like, I guess, Amar and Divya. They are, they have dealt with this common trauma in very, very different ways. Okay. Divya has gone out, become a firefighter, risks her life all the time so that people don't have to go through what she went through in losing a family member. And Dylan has just become, he became, had to become the man of the house and he took that responsibility excessively seriously from the age of 15 on onward and has just played with caution you know just that straight and narrow I got to get things done you know I have to provide and my sister and da 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 and I'm not taking unnecessary risks and etc etc um and so they, they come at this from very different angles but there was always that deep friendship that they'd had growing up because they've known each other since they were five um Without giving too much of it away because it didn't come out yet. But that's kind of what it's And it comes out, what, August 2nd, I think? August 2nd. Okay. So August everybody 2nd. go pre-order your copy right now. <laughs> yeah. And I am, and I, I just started um, promoing on social media, and I guess I can tell you guys, but I am doing a pre-order campaign with a local um, indie bookstore called One More Page Books. Okay. And um, there's a link in my bio, and I'll try to put some, I'll try to put out on Twitter and Instagram a little bit more. But um, if you pre-order from this bookstore, I have special swag that's going to go home awesome. with you too, from that. And it'll be signed books and special swag. So, um Go pre-order from One More Page Books or wherever. But if you want the special swag, go to One More Page Books and I'll put the link in, link in my bio. Okay. Can you email us all okay. the information and we'll put, because when this episode comes out, it'll still be time for people to pre-order. The book won't be out yet. Oh, and we'll put it in the yeah. show notes. Okay. Yeah. I will send it to you. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Okay. Are you ready to get into round out questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote, okay you wrote a perfect future couple tease which we touched on a little bit earlier in matched by masala share with the seek share with us the secret to teasing a side character's upcoming story so it goes back to the advice i got from my mentor and she said you got to know what the next couple books are going to be about you know at, you know even if you don't have them completely planned out you got to be able to tease it you got to know who the next so again the same way that amar and divya came to me in writing that one um i'll just say it sunny and sangeeta came to me actually they kind of were in the book one but like their story started coming to me while i was writing amar and Divya. Okay. And um, and so that's how I was able to tease to tease them. Um, and so their story, I, I I mean, I just handed that 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 manuscript in a, like a month ago. Um, so those edits are coming my way, but that is my runaway bride. Oh um, <laughs> we love that, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and that thought literally came because I was like, you know, what if I ran away from my wedding? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, my mom would have been so mad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the money, money, Mona. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, our weddings are like, uh, the five-day reunion is not kidding. Beautiful. Are, yeah, not cheap. These are big weddings. And, um, yeah, I'm like, oh, they would have been so mad. Like, <laughs> let's write about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think, I think as I'm writing, I am trying to plot out the next, so I do have ideas, um, for the next two or three books in this series. Um, so I have a contract with, um, special edition for a few more books in this, Yay, in this one. Okay. So I have a okay. runaway bride. Um, and then the other ones, potentially I have the groom that was left behind is the one thought oh, I had. That's good. Oh. Yeah. And then I have, as I was writing Sunny and Sangeeta, some other characters came to me and I was like, oh, I like these people too. 
So we'll um, we'll see we'll see what happens with that. So yeah, I'm working on those. I feel like weddings, wedding romances can just be so fun. And when you think about everyone that's involved oh, yeah. in making a wedding happen, there's so many stories you can do. I mean, every from the yeah. wedding planner to the groom that's left behind to the bride that ran off. <laughs> like there's just so much right. you can do. To the caterers, the caterers, yeah, caterers, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and Amar and Divya, so it, like I like, you know, like Anil, Anita and Nikhil were in Amar and Divya's story. Amar and Divya are in Sunny and Sangeeta's story because Amar and Sunny went to culinary school together. So they make a showing in that story um, as well. So it's fun to see the other characters. And even in the second First Chance that's coming out in August, I have from my second book that came out, Then There Was You, um, oh. Anita, uh, Annika and Daniel, they're in that. Because Daniel's a... Um, a helicopter flight medic. So they call he caused paths with firefighters. Oh, I love that. I love oh, it. Have them cause paths. Right, a little Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah. You heard it here, yeah. folks. So when you read the book, which you should be pre-ordering <laughs> after you listen to this episode, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Can you describe for us the best teacher you ever had? So I had so many, so many fantastic teachers. Um, I would go back to say fifth grade. I had um a woman named Mrs. Bates, who at the time was a terror. We all thought she was <laughs> terrible. We thought she was so mean. Um, we just thought she was an old bitty. But, you know, you look back and you're like, Mrs. Bates um, expected the best of us, mm-hmm. right? Like she, we got it. She, we thought she was mean because when we didn't try hard enough and she knew that there was greater potential, even at age 10, she got upset, right? Because she was like, you're not really doing what you should be doing. You can do better than this. You can do better. I expect better. Um, because you can do X, Y, and Z. Um, and she was also really good about like um, expanding our creativity and and all the, and it wasn't just like do all the math problems, you know, it was like all different kinds of things. So she was a great fifth grade teacher. Then I think in high school, I had an awesome biology teacher who, it wasn't just the biology he taught, but again, it was the person that he was, right? You can do this. I think it was like a second level, second year biology class. And I was in a class, I think me, one other girl, and the rest of it was all boys. And we were like juniors in in high school. And he was just like, he's like, do not let those boys like push you around. If you know the answer, he's like, just say it. He's like, you're, you know, there's, there's, you're in this class. You you got into this class. So, you know, so he was Mr. Melly. That was his. And um, and so he was just a fantastic, just a support person. And then I think, you know, in college, there were just various professors and things like that. But it came down when I was trying to think about an answer for this, I didn't have one answer, because I feel like the best teachers that I've ever had were the ones who saw potential, you know, even like, you know, right now, one of my biggest mentors is Christy Barth. Um, We're in the same um, chapter together. And she's the one who was like, listen, if you're writing a series, you have to do it this way. And she was the one who was like, you can do reels on Instagram. Let me show you how to do it. I was like, I don't know how to do that. She's like, yes, you do. You do. <laughs> and so, you know, like all, like all the little things she says, she's, you know, and sometimes you're like, oh my God, Christy, I can't do that. She's like, that's not true. You can do it. You just haven't done it yet. Right. So I think our best mm-hmm. teachers are ones who um, like, or like, you know what, just try it. And and then if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But you haven't gone through your life saying, I don't know if I can do that because you didn't try to. All right. So you've already had this experience very recently, but you walk into your home after a long vacation. What's the first thing you do? I'm so anal. I unpack. <laughs> Same. I cannot. I can't. And I start laundry. I can't take those dirty clothes from vacation. And and you know what? It, 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 I come home and I swear we've we've walked in at midnight. And I'm like to my husband, I'm like, get me the laundry. Like everything else, <laughs> me the laundry. I'm putting that in, and then I have to go upstairs and take out all of the toiletries. So when I wake up in the morning, there's a tooth. I'm not. I don't want to hunt in the morning for my toothbrush and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So at least I do that. I may not unpack everything else, but the dirty clothes and the toiletries that. That, that that comes out. Yeah. I'm not the person who's like, I'm going to bed. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> My like before we go anywhere, I deep clean the house because I want to come oh, home yeah. to a clean house. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> A hundred percent. I agree. I, I I make sure everything's like I don't want to come home to clutter. Yeah. Nope. Mm-hmm. Yep. Agree. Well, as romance readers, we love meddling aunties. So could you tell us one of your favorite fictional meddling aunties? Okay, I have two answers to this. Okay. One is I love um, Tom Holland's Spider-Man on Aunt May. Mar- Marissa yeah. Tomei. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like I've never best. thought of that. That's a really good answer. <laughs> 
She's the best Aunt May. I love her. Um, and then I have to say the aunties in Dating Dr. Dill, Nisha Sherman, oh, they were Dr. Good, yeah. Dill, because she named one of them after me. So Nisha and I are friends and she and I love dating Dr. Dill. And you know, she she asked if she could use a few of our names to for some of the aunties. And we were like, yes, do it. So I'm just super excited to be one of the meddling aunties, uh Karina's meddling auntie, Mona Auntie, um, <laughs> in dating Dr. Dill. So I'm gonna say that I'm my own favorite meddling auntie yeah. in that book. <laughs> well, are you a, a meddling auntie in real life? <laughs> Do you get to be a meddling auntie? No. No, I try to, you know, I try really hard to be the cool auntie. Okay. And the problem is, is, is my kids keep telling me, my kids are like, you're just not that cool, mom. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that cool. If you were to go back and revise your very first manuscript, where would you start? So my very first manuscript um, ended up being Then Now Always, which was my debut book. And um, I would start at the beginning <laughs> and I would just go through the whole thing again. Um, I, 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 I actually don't read my books cover to cover. I think we'd, I was talking with an author the other day and I realized I'm like, by the time it gets to this point, like I'm already on the next project, yeah. right? So I don't sit mm-hmm. down and like read my books cover to cover. I will open them and be and like get a clip, you know, I'll read a little bit every once in a while. And even that mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I could have said that better. I could have done this better. But I really no. feel like I love my debut book. I love Sam and Maya and I love that story. But I feel like a couple, you know, a few years into it now um, that I have learned so much that I could go back and I might be able to make it better, you know, change. I don't know how much I would change. Maybe I would just change the words, you know. I love the characters. I don't, I mean, I would just find different ways of saying things or something. Um, but I, and I feel like I could do that with any book. Um, I think that's part of the reason I don't go back and read them because I know I can't change them anymore. Yeah. So they are what they are. Well, I'm just excited for your career to keep going because I mean, you don't have a ton of books out, but your, your voice is like your voice. Like it's, even with the few books that we have by you, it's like if you're one of those authors, if you took the cover off a few chapters in, you could be like, this is Mona. So I just can't wait to see where you keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I I plan on, um, this was always my dream to do and I plan on doing it for as long as I can until I don't like it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm having a great time. What was your last unputdownable read? That's easy. That was After Hours on Milagro Street. I mean, I'm going to show it to you, even though we're not doing video. Angelina M. Lopez is also a good friend of mine. And so I have the early copy. And oh my God, you guys, it's coming out July 26th or something like that. You guys might have had access to it, but um, oh, so good. So good. The cover is gorgeous, I must say. The yes. Cover is. You know what? And it's 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 this book. It's it's um it's like a four hundred page book, and you learn so much about United States history that, quite frankly, we should know, but we do not. Yeah. And so, thank mm-hmm. you to Angelina for um for opening our eyes to to you know um to what was happening with the railroad and all of that kind of thing um at, in the form of this super fun, super hot and steamy cuz it's Angelina so you know <laughs> um that it's going to be super hot and steamy um book. She it's incredible. I didn't I I took it on an airplane on these many trips back and forth to see my kids and um I finished it and then I was like on an airplane. <laughs> like, <I'm laughs> what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> Well, then I had to open my computer and write my own book. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, I'm technically on deadline. Let's do that. Let's work on it a little bit. (laughs) We know that we have the new book coming out in August and you already touched on you should be getting some edits coming back. But currently, what are you working on that you can tell us about? So I'm currently working on um the fourth book in the once upon a wedding series which are actually characters that you haven't met yet that you'll meet in Sunny and Sangeetha's story that's um Rena and Akash okay. and um their story parallels in the background while Sunny and Sangeetha are trying to get together um okay. i just briefly i decided to take I was like, what if there was a couple that was already together, but nobody knew that they were together. And so they had all this tension between them. They were together, but they had to pretend they didn't even like each other. 
Um, and they're big businessmen. They're big, big business people, right? So she is the daughter of a hotelier, hotelier and he, and you'll know this when you read really, he ends up buying her hotel because it's about to go bankrupt. And now she's mad. Oh, God. Now she's, <laughs> oh, the tension. <laughs> now she has to work for him. And so many things. So this is what I'm like, quote unquote, drafting. So this is the basic idea. I don't want to say too much because I don't know what's going to change. Um, but that is that is what I'm currently working on. Um, and then that in the back of my mind also is the for the book after this one will be the groom that was left behind. Okay. Oh, I and I gave him a little bit more time because I decided he needed time to he needed time to get over that. Yeah, I yeah. love that so much. I'm just imagining like secret rendezvous in the stairwell in the back <laughs> or like a quick yeah. kiss on the elevator or something <laughs> like well you know what inspired me was actually Bridgerton and all of that tension between Kate and Anthony right and I was like but they want to be together mm-hmm. everybody knows and I'm like okay what if they're all ready together and now people are like what is your problem right yeah. like that kind of thing so love it see <laughs> love it yes well lastly where can everyone follow you online so I am super active on Instagram at Mona Shroff author. Um, and it's linked to my Facebook, also Mona Shroff author. I I am on Twitter, um, but not as much. That's Mona Shroff Right. And I am really trying very hard to get on TikTok more. Um, it just scares me a little bit. So on TikTok, I think I'm Mona Season Sees and Writes. Um, and I did do a few videos and things and so um i am gonna do a little bit more on tiktok um i think book talk is huge over there and um what little i do do does seem to get like people are looking at it so i'm trying to get there more but instagram is is my home that's right and i have a website which is linked to all of that kind of thing so um and, and all like buy links and stuff are there too um but yeah that's where to find me online well thank you for letting us hang out with you again we can't wait for you to come yes. back. <laughs> Just saying. You guys are the best. <laughs> I love the support you guys give. It's so uplifting and it's so wonderful to get that kind of support. So thank you so much for reaching out and hosting this wonderful podcast and having us authors on so we can talk about all the things we love to talk about.